This show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Stop putting your online data at risk. Get protected at expressvpn.com slash yang. One thing that a producer friend of yours said that really um, seemed telling was, look, people come to us for comfort. Like, they don't see us as the news. Uh, I, I thought that was incredible. Uh, and, and there is something fundamental about uh, two different purposes. One would be I'm going to edify and inform, and so I'm going to serve you some stuff that might be not that scintillating. It might be kind of boring. It's like broccoli as programming. And then there's this other direction that it's like I'm entertainment. Like I'm going to have a certain patter and rhythm and characters and something that you can cheer or boo. Right. Yeah. And that was in one of our uh, uh, planning meetings. So that was a senior producer. And um, it's definitely something that, you know, stood out and something I remembered because you're abdicating your role as a journalist. And that's it's confusing because otherwise it kind of looks like a newscast. You know, you have an anchor sitting at a desk with, you know, you know, the, the TV over his shoulder and you're covering things that are in the news. That's what I think is really dangerous when it looks like something that should be reliable, but it, it, it isn't really, then that's, that's to me where the problem comes in. This week on Yang Speaks, we interview Ariana Picari, who until very recently was a producer at MSNBC. She resigned publicly, saying that the business model of cable news is distorting journalism in a way that is not good for the public. Uh, You can imagine why we wanted to talk to her. It's a fascinating conversation for those of you who wanted to understand the internal dynamics of what's happening in various news organizations. This is the episode for you. And Ariana has earned our respect and admiration for doing something that very, very few other people have done, and that's actually act on principle. Uh, So tune in this week. But before then, Zach and I are going to talk about a whole lot of stuff. The ongoing drama, the election, coronavirus, you name it. Andrew, real question, man. What's going on in the world? I'm I'm trying to, I want, I want you, I think this is a good way to start the episode. Our listeners out there, there's no source of truth. There's news coming left and right saying the election's fake. It's not this. We've got coronavirus all over the place. Um, we got a Georgia runoff. No one knows anything. For the average human, I feel for them because there's just so much noise out there. So what is going, let's start with the election. Andrew, Please make sense of this for me, for anybody listening. What's going on? It is very painful, Zach. The Republicans have identified a strategy that's actually working for them politically, even though it's not going to change anything in the end. But it's changing a lot in the interim in a very painful way, where I saw something that said 50% of Republicans don't think this election was fair. Uh, And they've been leveling accusations that have been completely baseless and groundless and have no legal foundation. They just bring lawsuits they get tossed out. Uh, you know, in a lot of these environments, uh, there were Republicans who were definitely in the room counting votes, but also in some cases running the whole process. And they're looking up saying, like, why Why are you uh, accusing me of, of fraud? I mean, there was a recount in Georgia just confirmed it that Georgia went for Joe. So, uh, so this is a loser legally. It's a loser on Jan 20 when Joe uh, becomes the new rightful occupant of the White House. But it turns out, and this is bad for all of us, it's a winner politically. It's a winner that there are all of these uh, Republican voters who are very passionate about uh, the fact that Trump somehow still should be the president uh, and that this election was not uh, free and fair. And that's going to have negative effects for years. You know, it's like if you can't trust uh, something like a vote count that's been reported by every media, major media organization, uh, you know, what what's left to trust? I'm, um, here's what I thought I'd do. I would I'd try to put in some kind of here's what we know, here's what's happened, like factually. Um, and I want to talk about someone who's controversial, um, Tucker Carlson. Um, 
who, for context and Tucker, he says some things and does some things I really disagree with and do not like at all. But he was really fair to us on the trail. I think he was fair to a lot of candidates. Um, and there are times he covers stuff that no one's touching, which I do respect. Um, so this is what seems to have happened. Sidney Powell, who's one of Trump's attorneys, has done a whole bunch of press conferences with Rudy Giuliani right behind her, sweating his hair dye all over his face or whatever. Um, she has claimed that, quote, communist money is being funneled, quote, communist money, end quote, uh, is being funneled through Venezuela and Cuba to interfere with our elections and is quoted saying that the voting software tracking votes broke because of the landslide victory and so many votes coming in for Donald Trump that it broke. And which I want to put in context, this is the president of the United States lawyer right now has made an accusation of, in my opinion, I don't think this is an opinion. This is the greatest, that, if it's true, would be the greatest crime in American history. Like a, literally a stolen election. Tucker Carlson said, literally, that's a major accusation. And he comes out there, Tucker, far right, says, I'll let you come on my show, but we have asked you a million times for evidence and he's gotten nothing, received nothing. Yeah, it's... It uh, they they have zero, uh, and it's painful watching them fabricate various versions of reality. And, and it's even more painful seeing millions of Americans say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. The fact that Trump now is broken with Fox and now is saying, go to Newsmax and One America News Network. I mean, holy cow. I had to look up Newsmax. I had to be like, what, what, you know, like, do they have cable coverage? <laughs> like, is this a cable channel? Is this all digital? Is this like a... It's dark, man. And Tucker is saying this is if if there's no proof, this is nonsense. And he's a stop. And that was my point where if Tucker's doing it, guys, like, wake the hell up. This is just fake. This is literally the mind fuck part of my French. It's working, too. That's the yes, tough part. It's working. The well, mind fuck is working. Um, Mitt Romney made a statement finally, which in my opinion took too long. But he said, having failed to make even a plausible case of widespread fraud or conspiracy before any court of law, the president has now resorted to overt pressure on state and local officials to subvert the will of the people and overturn the election. And this is the statement part I love. It is difficult to imagine a worse, more undemocratic action by a sitting American president. Hey, Zach, I just want to say that like we're, that Trump is still winning because we're still talking about Trump, even though we lost. You know what I mean? Like, like we're, we're falling in a trap just talking about like Mitt talking about Trump. I mean, like the, the concrete impact is... Um, devastating on two dimensions. Number one, public trust erodes further. Uh, the media landscape splinters further to even less responsible actors. I mean, that's hard to believe. Uh, and then number two, you have a really, really problematic transition where you have this government in waiting that is unfunded. It can't talk to anyone who's in government. Um, there's a pretty long stretch uh, between beginning of November and late January. You know, that's like a solid two and a half months. Uh, and it's it's damaging where uh, you have like a real uh, void or or a vacuum or like a, a period when frankly no one's running the show and, and we we've kind of gotten accustomed to that as a country under the Trump administration but like this is not the time for that with COVID spiking um, so there there's some very very concrete negative effects of this dynamic for sure I appreciate the folks that are trying to that even see it, like Mitt Romney's like, oh my gosh, like this is getting so bad, even I'm gonna like, you know, uh, like have to to step in and uh, try and um, express fact or reason. Uh, fact and reason are losing in the United States. And that that's the thing that, um, that I, I think most people are still struggling with, really. Like there's like mm -hmm. this fundamental notion that humans are reasonable, which I, I tend to believe we're reasonable a lot of the time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then, and media organizations fall into this trap in a very big way where it's like, well, I'm going to now like present you with fact and reason. I'm very reasonable. I'm a journalist or whatever. And, and more and more people are just saying like, I don't care what you say. I don't care what your evidence is. I want to believe this. I will believe this. You're an asshole. Uh, you know, and, uh, and we need to reckon with that in a different way. It's like the language of fact and reason will not work on that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's clear that that uh, that Trumpism has now uh, transcended 
a particular um, unified set of facts. Uh, you know, now now it's on in like a it's in like the land of human nature, uh, and the, the land of human nature uh, operates on reason somewhat, but it also operates on feeling and emotion and tribalism and anger and hate and uh, um, humanity really, uh, and and this is one thing that does make me. Um, empathetic in a particular way is that there is something very dehumanizing to a lot of our uh, institutional life today. Uh, you know what I mean? Like you, you have these folks who are, um, who are kind of transformed into instruments of a bureaucracy or instruments of a major media organization. Uh, and then their progenitors of this narrative of reason say, Hey, be reasonable. Uh, and, and then if people are put in circumstances that are actually very, very unreasonable, like, like let's say their, uh, you know, town's only restaurant just closed because of COVID and like they're losing their job and like their family life's going, going to pieces, uh, then reason is not the right language, uh, you know, and, and Trump has managed to tap into another language that is working very well on tens of millions of Americans. And the folks who are using the language of reason just keep looking up saying, like, what? Like, what is going on? Like, at some point, the reasonable thing to do is to try and uh, peer into the realm of unreasonableness and say, okay, like, what's going on here? Uh, you know, that's certainly where I am. Well, the other reasonable thing to do is to ignore it um, or accept it as whatever. And what I was talking to my dad earlier is like, you know, we had a whole conversation on politics and he's like, this is so frustrating. You want to watch football. You want to go play golf. Like literally that's, that's distract yourself from. Uh, and that, that would be a respite for us all, uh, you know, and, and that's another thing that I dislike about what's happening here is we've had a very, very uh, divisive and tumultuous four years politically. Uh, and unfortunately, it looks like it's just going to continue because Trump's going to mm -hmm. bring the spotlight with them. And one thing we're going to talk to Ariana about in part is what the media organization's incentives are to cover or not cover Trump. Um, so media organizations certainly built Trump up on the way up. And then when he's in the white house, in, in a way you can't fault them for just following him around all the time because he is the president. Uh, so the question is what now, you know, like, like, and, uh, if the media networks follow Trump around post presidency, uh, then we're really going to have like a very legitimate, um, beef with them shall we say like a, a like like that would be the clearest sign of like hey at this point we just follow the man around because he rates and yep. uh and it does oh, not my. matter if it's good or bad for the public it doesn't matter if it's good or bad for the state of mind um but the the tough truth is that trump is a, just a much more interesting figure uh than most politicians you know i mean he's just a, like more more By far like he evokes like a more visceral reaction, either positively or negatively. And right now we have news media that thrives on trying to evoke that kind of reaction. Yeah. The news stopped caring about the well-being of the country and the people a long time ago. Um, but it's, um, I, I guess that's what right, we talked to Ariana about. Obvious. I mean, that's what this, this yeah. episode's about in many ways. Yeah. Meanwhile, like through all this, Americans are suffering and it is horrible. 12 million people going to lose unemployment benefits by the end of the year. And it's a good segue to tweet of the week where you said something that has 335,000 likes at this time right now, um, which is one probably your best ever, potentially. Uh, you said- Oh no, man, I've done better than that. I've done better really? than that shit. Yeah, I'm, like you, you, you look at the tape. <laughs> My bad, we'll look at the tape. It's up there though. Um, if, we, <laughs> if we ask you to stay home, we should also send you money so you can do so. Um, which is a very good Andrew Yang, simple, like cut to the core. Thoughts on what's happening with our lack of relief bill? Besides that, it sucks when you can say that too. But um, thoughts on where your head's at or what you think needs to happen now? I've gotten a couple of very big learnings over the last uh, number of weeks and months. Uh, learning number one is that um, Trumpism is still vital and powerful and rising um, because uh, institutional mistrust is vital and powerful and rising. And, and despite Joe's victory, uh, you know, we, we need to reckon with it still. Um, the fact that the, this was not a blue wave. In a lot of parts of the country, it was a red wave. And I, I talked to folks who lost uh, their elections, um, people like 
Max Rose, for example, where like, you know, like I, I expected him to win and, and I think, you know, most people expected him to win and he didn't. And there are now seven members of Congress uh, who uh, lost their seats that uh, are similarly surprised, I think. Um, but the other big thing has been just the epic dysfunction out of D.C. Really, really shameful. Uh, and, you know, like I, I at some point was like, look, Nancy you should take this deal because it's going to be one of the only ways to get help to people before the end of the year. Uh, and I think it's pretty objectively reasonable. You know, it's like you'd rather get help sooner than later. I mean, people are freaking suffering. Like restaurants and small businesses are closing right and left. Uh, and here we are, lame duck session. Like, is it going to happen? It's it's doubtful. Uh, and a lot of people are just like, well, it's freaking Mitch McConnell's fault. Um, to which I largely agree. It's like Mitch McConnell should be approving legislation that that it gets out the door. Um, but I, I think you have to take some responsibility if you're the Democrats too, because you're looking yeah, at it saying, okay, like, like what is the offer on the table? Like, you know, what can I work with? What, what can I not work with? Uh, there, there comes a point when, uh, doing something is better than doing nothing. And, uh, and so that, that's another, like, I have been staggered by the, the level of, uh, catastrophic dysfunction out of D.C., uh, it's been very, very heartbreaking, uh, uh, like saddening, like you name it. I mean, I, I think about it a lot. Um, and, and this is a time when it'd be tough if we did everything right. You know, if, if we had a government that had a shit together and was like going around like A, B, C and the rest of it, uh, and A would be, hey, we should send you all money. Like other governments are doing it, Canada's doing it. But, you know, it's like you, the odds of you actually... One, trusting the public and the government uh, and acting accordingly. And then two, not feeling like you have to go out and do that Uber shift uh, or uh, do something that's kind of discretionary um, to make ends meet. Like, go way up if I sent you money. It, like, it, it does not make that much sense for me to think that you're going to comply and shut down if you're like a bar owner. If you're a bar owner and you're like trying to dig yourself out of like this deep, dark, like well of red ink and then I come and say, hey, um, shut down, um, you know, you'll be like, I, I, you know, it's like, and I don't send you money, <laughs> then you'll be like, wait a minute, like what, what are you talking about? You know, like that, like I need to employ people. Like I, I've run a, I've run a business, a small business. Um, and like you feel very, very deeply responsible for your staff. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and it's impossible to pay your staff unless you operate. And so yep. like, uh, if you're told not to operate and you're looking at it being like, you know, and then there's like a human reaction. Again, if you send people money, they're much, much more likely to, uh, adhere to public health guidelines to have uh, like a sense of the future. Uh, and, and, uh, doing one without the other does not make that much sense to me. Uh, I think most other countries made the same conclusion, but our, government is just not up for the, cha the challenge here. And, and and it makes me sad how a lot of the commentary just revolves around, essentially, it is the other guy's fault. It's the other team's fault. Mm -hmm. And again, there's enough fault to go around, but, you know, like, at, at some point, um, at some point, someone has to govern. And, and <laughs> it, it, it makes me very, very sad that uh, mm -hmm. that anyone who wanted to think the worst of DC is uh, having their point of view confirmed every single day. You know, like one of the things I almost tweeted that I have not, but maybe I should, is that if you give Washington an excuse not to work, it will take it. Um, because it turns out them not working really doesn't hurt them very much. You know, I mean, like, like they still have re-election rates of 90% plus, like they're, they're still chilling. Uh, it, it's one reason why my backdrop is what it is. Like I'm here in Georgia, um, because we have to try and remove excuses for DC not to work. You know, like if you actually give it, uh, uh, give Democrats a chance where it's like, well, it's not Mitch McConnell saying no, no, no to everything. It's like, well, then the, the odds of a relief bill getting passed would shoot up, I presume. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm here trying to help make that happen. You know, and there's this also argument. I agree with everything you said, so thank you. I, I, there's this other argument. It's like, well, we don't have to pay people. They don't need a relief bill if you just opened up the economy, right? Like start shutting things down. Just let's just navigate this. It's only a small percentage of people getting COVID. And what I think is so wrong is that even if you did open up the economy, like no, like nothing held back, 
you like talk to restaurant owners. They're not at 100 percent capacity. Talk to restaurant owners in the South where it's all open. They're like the, the, dem- talk demand to is very, very low. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's because I mean, it's like, a virus. <laughs> It, it's like Disney World reopened and they, like did they have like you know throngs of people like flocking to go there no oh. so like so because guess what like there are a certain number of people that are just gonna look up and say is COVID still out there yes like hey maybe Do I'll I stay home it? no yeah it's like I mean I, I brought my family here to Georgia uh and uh the airport was pretty empty you know so on on the one hand uh, you're like, well, good for me <laughs> in the sense that, uh, you know, like you, your risk level feels lower, but then you're like the, the level of ambient economic activity is very low. And that's not because of government enforced shutdowns. That's because of millions of Americans just making an individual determination that that, that, that trip to Disney World's not worth it right now. Right. The, and it's one of the reasons like you and I were, were, were pretty bummed. Like our plan was just bring a whole bunch of people to Georgia and knock on doors and do all these things. And look, not only is, is COVID still real, but it's it's growing um, and we can't do that. We can't bring, sadly, like thousands of Yang Yang, you know, Yang Speaks listeners to come volunteer in Georgia because it's horrible. That's how you spread the virus. Um, and it, it breaks my heart. And we had a lot of ambitious plans, um, but like sadly, we have to pump the brakes a bit, you know, and it makes sense. No, I, I'm genuinely torn on this, Zach, because... Um, I saw that maybe a thousand Republican operatives are descending on the state. Really? Uh, yeah, and um, thirty-two million dollars in in funding on that side. Um, and so you want to be smart. I genuinely think that you could uh, campaign in a way that does not truly elevate the COVID risk. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. like if you're walking around outside, you have a mask on, um, and you interact with folks. Like I don't think the risk is really. Uh, being increased by your presence mm-hmm. um, and so like if you can imagine someone who lived in like you know let's say North Carolina they had to drive x hours to come through here and then they do some uh, some campaigning in a way that's responsible like I, I, I truly don't think that actually elevates um, uh, elevates the risk uh, at least you know it, it doesn't elevate the risk in a way that to me would foreclose the activity uh, and and there are folks that are are like minded to me, so I should have some fun people um, spending time uh, spending time on the ground here in Georgia. It it should be fun, both from inside and outside the state. I mean, we've got a lot of work to do inside the state. I've got events uh, with like a high school Democrats group, a college Democrats group, uh, right. Asian American community, the WNBA, Martin Luther King the Third, like you know, like all sorts of fun stuff coming. There's good work to be done. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm of two minds about it. Genuinely. It's like, uh, like, I, I think you'd want to temper any activities you have here so that they're responsible and safe. You don't want to, you know, just like have a mosh pit or something, <laughs> but, 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 yeah. but if you come in, like you're wearing a mask and you're, uh, you know, trying to register voters, uh, I, that's happening all the time right now. It, it'd be optimal, obviously, if like people got themselves tested and did things where they're like, okay, like, I'm sure I'm not spreading anything. Um, but, but I think that this is an all hands on deck situation. Uh, and I think that at least one side is going to be treating it that way. Yeah. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode of Yang Speaks. Skillshare is this awesome online learning community where people go to learn from experts in creative fields. Uh, They gain new skills. You can really get lost in your own creative learning. I'm looking at a class called Plants at Home. Uplift your spirit and your space by this guy named Christopher Griffin because there's a certain element of plants in a home that actually help. And that sounds stupid. It sounds like very like mom or Karen or whatever, but like live, laugh, love, but for real. like That totally works. We're not that far removed from, uh, you know, just running around in the woods. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) well, it's helpful because me, I just like buy an Ikea plant and like there's actually a little more art to that. So I'm learning about various versions of succulents and whatever the heck that, you know. I I bet the ladies love that too. You go in, they're like, ooh, this guy's sensitive. Ooh, yeah, good point. I water that. Yeah, if you water that, you know what that says? That says responsibility. That's what that says. (laughs) 
<laughs> so if you too want to figure out how to make your place greener and a million other potential avenues for learning and creativity, explore Skillshare.com slash Yang Speaks. The first 1,000 people to use our link will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. Receive free access to thousands of classes for a limited time. Be one of the first 1,000 to sign up at Skillshare.com slash Yang Speaks. So most classes are under 60 minutes with short lessons. They fit in your schedule. You can do it easily. There's no ads. They're always launching new premium classes, and it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. So it's cheap. It's awesome. It's effective. So break up your routine with kind of these spontaneous acts of creativity. Go to Skillshare.com slash Yang Speaks. Check it out. So we, we hit, as of yesterday, which is, yesterday was November 19th when we're recording this, uh, 187,000 new cases, which is essentially a record. Uh, if you look at the graph of cases, it's a tidal wave. It's an exponential increase. Thoughts on, you've got Thanksgiving. Normally, um, this upcoming Wednesday is the busiest travel day of the year. Suggestions for people traveling for Thanksgiving. I think some of these, cut like, some of the curfews are, you know, Things like that are, are getting ridiculous. But thoughts on how people handle their travel and um, holiday season this year? I can speak for myself. I mean, our plan was to have family members over, uh, and most of them were within like a driving distance. Most of them are very safe, uh, and the rest of it. Uh, and so we didn't have a problem with that. Uh, you know, like that that that, that would have been a fine plan. Here in Georgia, some people invited us over um, for like a socially distanced dinner. It was very nice of them. Um, and it would, again, just be a drive. So as, as long as you're not interacting heavily with folks in, uh, in an indoor environment um, on the way there and you're comfortable with the people that you're going to be seeing um, and maybe even socially distanced throughout, like I think that's a fine way to go. Okay. Yeah, we're doing the same thing where we, we, we have... Uh like a small family gathering, but everybody's been quarantined and things like that. I, I, I do encourage people to be safe. Uh, COVID is serious. Um, and now- Again, just just don't go to that Thanksgiving rave, you know? Don't go to like that. That that indoor rave. Pits, be careful. That's all, yeah. That, 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 like that, that's, uh, I, but I, you know, I think like getting together with family and extended family, um, you know, who, who, who you're, um, in contact with somewhat periodically, like as long, like particularly they're not high risk. Like I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend um, visiting your elderly parents necessarily, but you know, like that that's not a good idea at, at any point during this um, right. during this virus. So the last thing I think I want to ask you, Andrew, is that like we it kind of gets brushed on the rug with all the election nonsense, but we we have a vaccine now. We haven't been able to talk about it. We have two. It looks like two vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, both seem to have. Uh, 95 percent effective uh, COVID vaccines, which to me is like, I love. I've always been a capitalist, like pro capitalism, in my opinion. Like America is like hyper focused. Thank you, on science. Too, yeah, right? we came yeah. up with like like science gear just for the occasion. Science cap, yeah. science mask. I don't know if I wish I had one, I could put it on right now. Uh, but go science and and this one. Thank you, Moderna and Pfizer. Yeah. I'll never um, say anything mean about you again, pharma. I'm ever. kidding. Well, you, yeah, you guys, yeah. uh, I'm kidding. They're, they're problems. Um, <laughs> do you, like, uh, you've said this before on other things. Um, I think we should make the politicians try it on their own families um, before before it goes out, which I know is like kind of weird, like politicians get it first, but there's a lot of mistrust in the system right now in our, in our world. Like thoughts on how you would roll this out effectively I think having trusted public you know, figures works. make use of the vaccine is a good idea. Um, you know, like if the science um, checks out, I would do it. Uh, yeah. You know, the, I mean, the thought process is like, you know, look, everyone's going to get this thing eventually anyway. Might as well get this show on the road and do it in a way that uh, augments adoption. Um, there was an idea out of Freakonomics, uh, our friends at Freakonomics, Stephen Dubner, which I think was a really good one, is we should just have a freaking lottery where like every day someone who gets the vaccine is going to get a hundred thousand dollars and just like publicize that winner. I just like pay and like, you know, I mean, it, it would be a trivial cost to increase adoption. Um, because if you gave a hundred thousand a day, like what, what, what does that amount to? Like $36 million dollars over yeah. the year. That's like a penny compared to the cost of getting adoption up Not vaccine um, and reviving it. 
So maybe a hundred thousand is too uh, too conservative. Maybe we should go with like a million a day. I, you know, like like three hundred sixty five million dollars would still be worth it. Uh, so I, love that uh, I think that's a yeah. And then just publicize it. It's like the the vaccine you know winner of the day is like this person and being like I never thought I'd win. You know, just freaking publish that thing every single day. Uh, that's the kind of thing we should do to increase adoption. That would actually work better than me getting it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because people don't trust politicians anyway. Um, that'd be fun. Yeah. We, we, Anybody, if you, you get know, vaccine, you could do a million in like giving out in increments. It could be like, you get 500 bucks, you get 20,000 bucks. Like that's this true. freaking go bananas. Don't you guys love how Andrew Yang's answers to a lot of things revolves around giving people money? Cash. Uh, like, you know, does that not work on a whole host of problems? <laughs> Uh, I'm into it, man. I'm actually into actually just paying people directly to take the vaccine too. Um, also uh, a great a idea. Dark, but, but not bad. <laughs> like a, well, wait, 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 wait. Let's do some math on this. Hang on, hang on. Let's say let's say you get need 330 million people vaccinated. Like 10 bucks, like 3.3 billion. Um, again, trivial in the in the context of trying to resuscitate a 22 trillion dollar economy. Um, you yeah. get a vaccine, we'll give you 10 bucks and a lollipop. You know, you had a kid like yeah. <laughs> a kid with you. I want to make sure uh, we quickly talk about Humanity Forward too um, on a lot of the stuff we're doing on cash relief because yes. um, we look, we've looked at this left, right, and sideways, you know, every direction. And the only way we get anything done in Congress is by actually building that network in Congress and talking to them, our elected officials, um, and convincing them that cash relief is the only way forward to get us out of this pandemic. And it's not a hard argument, but it takes time and money. Oh, I do this every day. You know this, Zach. I talk to, um, on average, at least one, maybe closer to two or three members of Congress on any given day, um, saying, hey, you know what would be great? Cash relief. And a lot of them are into it. Um, so we have to just keep pushing because the people know it's right. A lot of legislators, you get, get them one-on-one, -on -one, they know it's right too. So we just need to make it safe for them all to move forward and act. Uh, so we're trying to build a caucus on Capitol Hill uh, and we could really use some resources to do so. It's like the people's lobbyist uh, where I had a video where it's like, we're going to raise money for this effort and then pelt members on the head with the money. Um, but the truth is that politicians respond to financial resources because they know that they're going to be up for re-election in two years or whatnot. Uh, and if someone gets behind them, uh, let's say the Yang Gang, you know, let's say like a group that's like one to two million strong, depending upon uh, like how, how you're counting it, then members of Congress can look up and say, ooh, like uh, this could actually make my race easier. And it's also the right thing to do. Um, and then if the organization has money behind it, uh, then they're like, Ooh, like, you know, this group might actually put resources into my race. Like when I run for reelection, if I am pro cash relief, like they could actually help defend me. That's the kind of thing that tips legislators, uh, over the finish line. So we just need to raise enough money where they can see that we have a professional lobbying org with a bankroll that can actually help get them uh, reelected. I mean, that, that's like the, frankly, like the, the crass reality of it all. Uh, so we are raising money for this effort. Again, the people's lobbyist. Uh, and we are punching way above our weight class already because everyone regards the Yang Gang as uh, this awesome, cool, vital new force in politics. Uh, yeah, they're like me. They're a little terrified of the Yang Gang too if they mess up. Love you guys. <laughs> and, and, and so... So we need to take advantage of this in the biggest way. Um, so you've probably seen we have a national uh, advocacy campaign that we're raising money for. That is essentially this lobbying campaign. Um, and, and it's a phenomenal investment in the sense that uh, we can increase the odds of cash relief getting out there. So if you give 10 bucks, uh, you know, like we might be able to help increase the chances of you getting uh, a lot more out of Congress uh, than might otherwise be the case. Yep. It is, it's going to research, it's going to experts on the Hill, it's going to organizing, and it's going to advertising. It's like the big four. Uh, it's pretty standard, um, but we'll do it in very Andrew Yang style where it's out of the box, effective, high ROI, um, the same way a good builder should. Let's do it. Let's go fight it out on Capitol Hill.
And I'm excited about it because I've been having these conversations with members, and and a lot of them are receptive and responsive. So if we if yeah. we have the resources, on both sides, yeah. Us, we, yeah, 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 For both sides. And and we're not not yet allowed to talk about who's committed, but it's um, who. <laughs> no, we can't tell. But if, if if you're interested in donating, it's uh, it's movehumanityforward.com. Um, you click the donate button. Um, it's all going to cash relief right now. Um, advocacy lobbying. Uh, efforts to get this done people are already probably know that like we've given almost 10 million dollars directly to families so you know we believe um but like I, I think that this is another very effective way to try and unlock cash for people uh you know the needs are so great um like i, I see this as like uh, we'll spend a million to maybe unlock tens of billions you know what i mean it's like a yes. very high leverage move it's it's there too. I mean, the stock market's pricing in that there's going to be a stimulus bill of one trillion dollars. So the the question is, eventually, when God willing, Congress does something. Um, so the the question is, what's the composition of the trillion? You know what I mean? Like r- right now, you know that trillion's probably going to get tilted very much towards institutions. Uh, if you tilt it more towards people, that's a potential value of hundreds of billions of dollars for people, families communities amen uh and you know th- that's what i'm chasing one of my favorite quotes like the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing and andrew and i you and i we've been we've been to the top of the political mountain if you will we've met the leaders we've met the help we've met the people that are supposed to be saving us and i promise you the calorie's not coming this is it like you're this is the coalition of the good people trying to do something and this is us and it, it it's terrifying but this is how anything gets done. And so we, we are asked is, you know, help us do good. Um, this is what we're doing. Uh, help us be the good people. Um, and let us be the cavalry because it's not coming. It's just us. So um, moviemanyforward.com. We're doing some cash relief. We're going to be doing a while. We'll keep you updated on the show. And with that, let's go to Ariana Picari and talk about all the problems in our media. And you can go on for days on this, Andrew. Uh, but tune in, guys. It's good. You know at Yang Speaks, we are all about our data being ours. And one way you can protect your data is by using ExpressVPN. What's what's ExpressVPN? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. When you beam into the internet using a server far, far away, and no one knows it's you. Big companies use it. Spies, I assume, use it. Cool people who don't want anyone selling and reselling their data use it. And you can use it too. It's fast. It's easy. ExpressVPN is the number one rated VPN by Wired, Verge, CNET, uh, and Yang Speaks. I gotta say, like, you know, we, we looked at the field and said, these guys have it. Uh, there's another perk, too, is that you can access content that's only available in Europe <laughs> or whatever other country it is. Like that European exclusive content. You could be like, beam me to Europe. I'm gonna watch people talk in French. Uh, so go to expressvpn.com slash yang to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. expressvpn.com slash yang. It is my pleasure to welcome to Yang Speaks the uh, public editor of the Columbia Journalism Review and former MSNBC producer Ariana Picari. Ariana, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. I'm a huge admirer, as I know many people are, because you did something that dozens of people imagine doing. Millions of people are wondering why more of it doesn't go on. Uh, but you actually resigned from an MSNBC producer role because you were concerned about the nature of broadcast journalism in terms of fulfilling its function and uh, edifying the, the public. Uh, and I, I want to start all this out by saying that um, you identify issues that are um, germane to any broadcast media news outlet, that this isn't like, a, you know, some kind of MSNBC is like singular. Um, and despite the fact that I'm on air on CNN, like I 100% agree with you that these issues are uh, endemic to essentially the medium. Uh, and it's not just an MSNBC thing. So many Americans right now are concerned that we are more polarized than ever. Uh, And I think a huge part of that in people's minds is that 
uh, the media is not helping. <laughs> the media is not really bringing us together around a common set of facts, but instead is uh, kind of separating us into camps. For sure. And I, um, that was one of my big concerns when I, when I was at MSNBC, um, I definitely saw, and, um, the polarization, um, uh, I was living it in real time and I could see how it affected my family at home in Virginia, um, right away. And it's, it's weird. I felt like the polarization was almost having, um, it was, it was having kind of a counter, uh, productive <laughs> effect in some ways for, for, um, MSNBC. But yeah, I definitely, I can, I call it, you know, I some ways call it the gerrymandering of the media, you know, and, th and everyone on the left kind of keeps getting pushed further and further to the left. And on the right, they keep getting pushed further and further to the right. And really it, it's driven largely, not entirely, not wholly, but largely, um, by, you know, the financial incentives, um, that are required, you know, they gen up their audiences. And, um, so, you know, it's being done for profit and by, uh, and a very few pe people are actually benefiting. Um, so yeah, my concerns are, are definitely, you know, for, um, the democracy, um, at large and, and it plays out in many ways. So, so you started out in a different environment in public radio. Uh, and so how was that experience for you? I guess that was relatively early in your career. Yeah, I started, I, you know, right after college, I had a um, crisis of identity and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I started all first and, and working as a financial advisor for, for, for uh, Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. And um, it was actually kind of during that miserable commute around the DC Beltway, I discovered public radio. And over a number of years, I kind of set my sights on public radio because I realized that's really what I wanted to be doing. I just love the craft of it. And I loved um, the, the way that they told stories. I had never had a desire to go into TV. And um, I also didn't really do internships through college because I was, you know, working full time and just a little bit lost in general. So it wasn't until after, a while after college I discovered NPR and set my sights. And I started at, at uh, NPR in, in 2002, and um, loved every day from from the you know first minute I was there. So so you were attracted to NPR. And I have to say, when I was out there campaigning around the country, NPR was like its own oasis of news. Like there were folks that listened to it. Uh, the local NPR stations uh, seemed very free. They were very pure. You'd go in and, and they had listeners who really wanted a particular version of both the news and the listening experience. Uh, you were attracted to that. And it sounds like you were there from 2002 to 2013, more or less. I mean, you were doing some other yeah. stuff, but it was all uh, public radio directed. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It's like 11 years or so? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just this morning I was listening. I, you know, I listen to KQED frequently, which is the San Francisco station. And, you know, it's it's such a, you know, pleasure because, the you know, the local – um, public affairs program forum. They were they covered um, the local um, uh, drug overdose epidemic and how it's gotten worse through the pandemic. And then they moved on to um, the the new COVID vaccines for another thirty minutes. And it's this long, in depth conversation and things that I didn't even know I needed to know. But yeah, I mean that, that's it's it's just so much <laughs> more and so such better information that you can get. Yeah, and N NPR is supported through um, public funding. Um, though, though NPR now has so many listeners and sponsors and advertisers that uh, it's uh, largely self-sustaining and a lot of people have also donated to it. Um, so it's like a combination. Um, and then you wound up at, at MSNBC, which uh, it, it seemed like your uh, experience was a, a bit different. Uh, how was the experience? I kind of came into it with the attitude. I mean, we knew that um, everything was kind of you know, we knew that ratings, I knew that ratings, um, played a part in, in our daily lives. Um, I didn't understand the extent of it. And I thought coming in, I could bring my skills that I had in public radio. And part of that is really trying to find new and interesting and compelling 
stories and angles and voices. And they would want to, you know, they would be, they would welcome that because uh, in my mind, I felt like oh, one of my big criticisms of p cable news coming into it was the repetition. It was just, I just felt like it was, you know, you're watching the same five or six stories kind of all day throughout the day. So um, I thought that that was an opportunity for me to come in and, you know, make things better, right? Um, so I, I struggled with that for a few years. Um, I really, I, you know, I tried different types of stories and kind of I strengthened my pitches and um, realized, okay, they might not listen to me the first time, but I'll keep coming back and, you know, trying to, to, to sell this other idea or strengthen my argument. Maybe they don't, you know, maybe it's not intuitive why something um, is a good idea. And over time, I, you know, I, I, I got a little bit frustrated, but um, then started to get at the same times a little bit of seniority. So I was more involved in the, the planning meetings, you know, with the senior producer and the executive producer and, or the senior producers, there's usually more than one. And at that point, I realized the extent that they really, that the ratings really drove all of the decisions. And it was, it was, it's down to, you know, it's the first thing out of their mouths as soon as you throw out an idea. And they don't necessarily talk that way in the wider editorial meetings with the full staff. It really was in the, the smaller planning meetings. You know, it's the first thing out of their mouths, like how things rated the night before, how they thought something did. And those, those ratings are broken down by quarter hours. So they have a pretty good understanding of what did well and what didn't do well. And so they will track the topics, of course, and they'll track the guests. You know, so if you know, it's the, if a guest does well, or if a guest guest rates well, or or not, they really rely on that um, for almost every decision. So um, it that's it wasn't until the last few years when I it, the reality um, became you know pretty stark to me, and then you know I wasn't going to be able to fight that fight. You know, there wasn't you know, these people are just doing their jobs and it's all out of their hands. It's out of Lawrence's hands. It's out of Phil Griffin's hands. It's, it's at a higher, way higher pay level um, where, the, where the, the problems are. Yeah, one of the things you said was that, look, these are good people, uh, you know, trying to do good work, but uh, they're put in a position where their job does not necessarily produce the kind of journalism you'd want it to, which is something I completely uh, get and empathize with is that if you put people in a position where their incentives are all steering them one direction, you kind of expect them to end up uh, listening to those incentives. You know, it's like, and if you don't listen to those incentives and let's say your ratings underperform uh, consistently, then someone's going to make a change. And so like, that's the, the race you're always running. Uh, like, were there other people that ever expressed any misgiving? Maybe someone else from like a similar background as you? Yes. Um, those conversations didn't happen very often, but over the last year or two when I was there, there were times when I would have conversations in private with other producers. And um, certainly they, you know, with a couple of people, um, they said, I, I think we're making things worse. You know, um, some seem to think that, yeah, what we're doing here is probably benefiting Trump and would, would help him get elected again. The person who said we are a cancer, that is, that's one of those conversations. It was somebody in the building um, uh, and has been in the, the business a long time. So, um but it wasn't something that people talked about in the open. You know, it wasn't until I went in and sat down, like kind of one on one with them. Um, otherwise, the the comp, the the notion that ratings drive everything it's just it's really built into the process, and it's it's of course you know that's just that's just what you do. And you know, most of those people came up through the commercial TV system somehow. And I obviously have a public radio background and none of the editorial decisions I ever made before were based on how it would rate or how big of an audience we thought we would have. I mean, we always wanted a big audience, but you know, you hope that, you know, what you're doing is compelling enough to hold people's attention. Um, but that's not what determines those decisions. And so for me, you know, it was like, it, it really 
raked against my <laughs> nerves every time I heard them say something like, you know, that's not going to rate. And when it's something that I knew would be a good topic, some of the decisions were made out of ideological reasons. Um, but it also kind of drives the division that that we're seeing and the polarization in this in the country. So they might be pumping up, you know, um, ideas that are exciting to some people, but then there was never, you know, they don't get excited about the, you know, someone with a more nuanced or moderate take on things. And um, so that that just kind of keeps driving everybody apart. And there's, you know, you know, there's no sense that, okay, there is some benefit to compromise <laughs> every now and then. I just, I know that that's not a popular idea right now because we've gotten so far away from that. But, um, you know, it, it, the, the, in my sense is that it just, the, it, when you stand back and look at the totality of, you know, all the w different ways that the financial incentives affect the content, it's just driving us down the wrong path. And it's only getting worse the way that I see it. All right. It's almost December. You haven't bought anyone a gift, <laughs> but if you're looking for a gift that they're going to love, we recommend Raycon wireless earbuds. These things are awesome. They work. They're comfortable. They cancel out noise. Mine are blue and they look badass. This is why I, I love them. Um, <laughs> I felt cooler when I put them on um, a little like back, the, like felt futuristic, if you will. Uh, and they work just as well. Like they work just as good as they look, if that makes any sense. Like they, you're not compromising quality for all that style. They are the smart buy in that they're just as cool and high quality as those other things, but they don't break the bank like those other things. So go to buyraycon.com slash yang today to get 20% off your Raycon order. This offer is available for a limited time only. You don't want to miss it. You can get this stuff for the holidays for your favorite someone, and they will love you for it. Trust us on that. I love mine. Zach loves his. That's buyraycon.com slash yang to get 20% off your Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash yang. You drew a couple of examples in your resignation letter, which I recommend that everyone uh, find and read because I just thought it was so brave and incisive and true. Uh, so thank you for it. And I'm a huge admirer of yours. You did something out of principle that the vast, vast majority of people don't ever do. Uh, and if enough people did what you did, we might actually have a chance. And I don't mean just in media, though the media is a significant part of this, but, uh, you know, in, in many different environments where your financial incentives are to uh, just pretend it's okay, um, and, and a lot of us can sense that it's not okay. So two of the things that you pointed out as uh, programming choices, one was that anything with Donald Trump or a response to Donald Trump rated better, and so uh, you, or j just every, about every cable news outlet covered everything Trump did, um, during his 2016 run, and then that became true, obviously, when he was president. Um, and then the inverse of that was that if there was something kind of educational or scientific uh, or deeper, then it would be less appealing or wouldn't rate as well. Uh, and so you wound up, wound up with like a bias towards uh, Trump all the time and less about, for example, what a public health uh, official or scientist was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Initially, when the pandemic started, they are professional journalists and they kicked into gear just like they should. And they were trying to get um, the information they could from scientists and doctors and frontline workers and um, developed a special. Um, Dr. Zeke Emanuel was, you know, on once a week um, to, to cover, you know, focus on issues related to COVID. And after a number of weeks, they discovered that that wasn't rating well. So then it got kind of, you know, started on Monday, Tuesday, and then they pushed it to a Friday because that's a day that they don't care as much about ratings because that's um, for our own programming, for MSNBC's or Last Word's own programming needs that, that it wasn't um, as important. And then it slowly just kind of fizzled out and died. Um, and it was because it wasn't rating well. And... And then you could see the 
coverage when they were would do a COVID segment, it really was about just the politics. Um, and they would have on science reporters or correspondents, but they were, you know, pushing them, trying to get them to talk more about the politics than the actual science. And it was through a time when there were a lot, you know, there, I mean, there's still lots of information coming out all the time about the, about the, the virus and vaccines and what we know and what we don't know. And that all of that was, you know, they would try to get to it if they could, or it just wasn't kind of the top line. It was something that was thrown in maybe as a, you know, an afterthought. Um, the, all of that information really got pushed to the wayside and it, they focused much more on the politics and it was, you know, the, uh, Trump attacking the blue state governors or, you know, what Trump, you know, what dumb thing Trump said or didn't say or didn't do. Um, it really focused on that. And I, I understand there's a time and a place for that, but it was just dominated everything. That drove me crazy on the trail too, where, it was always like Trump's stupid or inflammatory comment of the day. And then even like I'd be running for president in Iowa, New Hampshire, and they'd be like, Trump said this. What do you think of that? And I'm just like, are you kidding right. me? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Like, like, really? Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It, that, it, that, um, that same idea was pervasive throughout the, you know, and it was the last election cycle as well, um, the Democratic primary process. You know, if there was a personality dispute that got way more attention than any interesting policy conversation. And I think there were lots of interesting policy conversations we could have had, you know, um, the ideas that you had being the start of it. Um, uh, but then, you know, when it came down to the general and it was Biden versus Trump, I, you know, every, almost every single, I, I know that they tried to, to, to focus on Biden um, when they could, but it always turned into a segment about Trump. You know, they don't want to talk about anything that is negative towards Democrats because that was bad for the MSNBC audience. And the same thing, you know, applied to the Democratic primaries as well. You don't, there just wasn't a full discussion that ultimately benefits everyone. So um, I think I might have, have, uh, have been part of that or non part of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. I know. I, this is not exactly an unbiased audience I'm talking to right now. <laughs> but, yeah, but, no, no. I mean, <laughs> again, like this, this to me is more of like a systemic. Um, uh, no, it, it, um, broad, it, it for sure problem. is. And, and it, uh, yeah, I saw it happen. I watched it in t 2016. And so that, you know, when everybody was. I'm sorry. Um, everyone was shocked that Hillary didn't do better than she did. I, I was frustrated because I was like, no, there were there were polling numbers out that showed you know enthusiasm for her, you know, that were concerning, and you know that MSNBC wasn't covering that, so that liberal audience didn't, necess you know, necessarily. Well, that's rough. You know, like that there were actually some uh, numbers that cut the other way that weren't covered. I mean, that, that's that's actually new to me, relatively speaking. Maybe everyone knows that already. I, I was angry almost every day in those meetings <laughs> oh, wow. th through. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, it did. It was not pleasant because I I, I was at a point where I, I could. I, I mean, I never really bite my tongue anyway, but I. I just could not believe that they were making decisions about, you know, economic pol segments and, oh, that's not going to, you know, my, my, the day that I gave my resignation, they canceled an economic segment because, quote, it wasn't going to rate. And they filled it with some other, like, um, you know, not a serious segment. And um, I, you know, between the pandemic and I, I frankly had issues with how they were covering the George Floyd stuff, um, the, the protests. Uh, again, you know, the way that you, they covered the protests, they, they wanted conflict. And they put the correspondence on the ground in a way that they, they, even if nothing was happening, they wanted it to seem like something was happening. And if there was a car that was on fire, they're going to play that video over and over again. Meanwhile, 95% of the protests were peaceful. But I've been in the control room going back to 2015 and, and the, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests then. People, um, they would monitor all of those protests. They'd have cameras and choppers, you know, they're monitoring the protests. And unless it turned violent, they would not, quote, take it live. You know, they, they wouldn't show 
that peaceful protest because nothing was happening according to them. You know, it was, it was boring and it wouldn't make good TV. So that, um, that is a type of thing that kind of got to me, um, through the George Floyd, um, coverage. Uh, there were, there were other elements. There were, there were, um, points about the, uh, election and election security, those stories kept getting sidelined. They were not covering them. They'd, you know, I, I was trying to get them to cover the issues, you know, how, how are you going to have a safe election, you know, with COVID? And, you know, there were lots of groups working on it. They, um, uh, it was really, really, really difficult to get them to cover that. Um, uh, there was, uh, uh, there were opportunities um, when Trump went to Tulsa. There were opportunities to 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 talk about some of the kind of painful history in this country. Um, it was it would have been very easy to discuss um, the history in Tulsa and the Tulsa riots or Juneteenth and what is all be, you know what is behind that and why it's so meaningful to the African American community. And you can trace the anger from those events to George Floyd. It, it would have been, it, it wouldn't have taken very long at all, but there were, there was, there was, um, a history there that I didn't know. And I know a lot of smart people and journalists didn't know, and it was a perfect opportunity to, to share that. And it helps the nation understand, you know, what is happening other than just, you know, people are angry and, and looting the local Walmarts. Well, one thing that a producer, a friend of yours said that really um, seemed telling was look people come to us for comfort like they don't see us as the news uh, I, I thought that was incredible and and there is something fundamental about uh, two different purposes one would be I'm going to edify and inform and so I'm going to serve you some stuff that might be not that scintillating it might be kind of boring it's like broccoli as programming and then there's this other direction that it's like I'm entertainment like I'm going to have a certain patter and rhythm and characters and something that you can cheer or boo. Right. Yeah. And that was in one of our uh, uh, planning meetings. So that was a senior producer. And um, it's definitely something that, you know, stood out and something I remembered because you're abdicating your role as a journalist. And that's it's confusing because otherwise it kind of looks like a newscast. You know, you have an anchor sitting at a desk with, you know, you know, the, the TV over his shoulder and you're covering things that are in the news. And so the audience, uh, you know, I realize that, you know, they, there's, there's an awareness that MSNBC is, um, uh, more opinionated than the, the straight, you know, 6 PM newscast. But at the same time, they're, they, they play it both ways. So, that's what I think is really dangerous when it looks like something that should be reliable, but it, it, it isn't really, then that's, that's to me where the problem comes in. I'm pretty sure news is in the name somewhere. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, you know, yeah. like I, I, there's somewhere in there, like there's the word news. Um, so, so you have these concerns that are building up over a period of time. Um, and then you actually had to bite the bullet and say, wait a minute, am I going to keep doing this or am I going to leave? Uh, and when you did decide to leave again, I thought it was so courageous because you weren't sure what the next step was. It wasn't one of these situations where you were like, oh, I'm going to bide my time and then get some kind of sweet, uh, job offer and this other thing. And then I'll, um, you know, write my letter. Uh, so what was it that actually... Uh, pushed you to action? Because again, I'm sure that there are dozens or hundreds of people in media who've at least reflected for a moment on the concerns you're describing, but they did not do what you did. Um, well, I first want to say I don't blame most of the people in the industry for for not just picking up and quitting their jobs because the industry is in a crisis. I mean, the last several years, uh, they've done relatively well, but um, you know, yeah, who would? I don't blame anyone either, FYI. Yeah. Um, you, where, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Like, I, you know, if, if you're, if you want to stay in some element of the news business, then there really aren't a lot of other places to go. And if you have a family and a mortgage, you know, dependents, it's, it's a really hard choice to make. So I don't, I don't point fingers at them, but I got to a point where I, um, I had been contemplating leaving for a couple of years. 
Um, I wasn't, you know, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. Um, I had not pursued other jobs aggressively because I knew I was probably going to want to um, work on this issue some way, somehow, and probably come out. When I posted my resignation letter, I thought I would, I was just kind of putting that down as like a marker in the sand to say, this is, you know, where I draw the line and I'm moving on. And I thought that, you know, maybe a handful of people would, would respond to it at the time. I thought it was going to get lost to the internet, but I was going to use that just as like, you know, moving forward, you know, I quit the industry and this is why. I didn't expect the the reaction that I did, but I, um, it, it really was kind of all together. I just couldn't, you know, I, again, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic and, um, uh, I, you know, not a great time economically to, to quit one's job, you know, cause it was a, you know, it was a good job and with sure. good benefits and, um, you know, now I don't have any of that, but I have not regretted it for one second. Um, it's, I don't have that angry feeling <laughs> in me every day when I wake up. So, wow. Um, I mean, yeah, that's profound. So you post this resignation letter, you think, well, a few industry types will see it, but it'll just get lost to the internet. And you said that you weren't expecting the reaction that it got. Um, what was that reaction? I mean, I certainly know that I saw it and said like, wow, this person's awesome. I need to reach out. Uh, but like what, uh, but I don't know what you experienced at that point. Um, so yeah, like what happened next? Well, it was interesting. You know, um, one of the first outlets that picked it up was Fox News, and they they helped prove my point for me by saying, you know, MSNBC producer writes scathing letter about um, the divisive nature of her net network. You know, and and. and Without they took out all of the context, which is what they do, you know, and, and it, it, it's something that kind of drives up the, you know, that their audience and um, uh, and for for clicks, you know, to 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 get well, attention. each side loves it when they can point out that the other side is somehow yeah, uh, you know absolutely yeah bad or wrong yeah. Um, so I got a lot of response. Um, I got thousands of. Uh, notes and you know whether it's that it was through my personal website which until then had you know like <laughs> you know maybe two visitors um um the the piece itself has been read over 300,000 times on the, the actual website but then there was like there was lots of coverage elsewhere and um people wrote to me on Twitter, Facebook, uh Instagram and through my website I, I have thousands of notes from people across the spectrum you know uh, certainly I'll, I'll a lot of people um, on the right who read the Fox piece, you know, they were, you know, cheering me on. I think they think I might be something different. But um, um, people on the left also, and former producers in the industry, and academics, and grand and presidential candidates. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. They were like, you know, but there were there was this sense that like, thank you, like. We know that something is wrong, and a lot of people they're like, you know, we don't know why it's gotten so as bad as it is, and this helps explain that. Um, and you know, some people will say, you know, what are you naive, like to think that ratings don't drive, you know, the news business or corporate media or whatever. And, and I, my reaction to that is, what are you naive to think it's not doing damage to our lives every day? You know. Um, so, but in I just got like it, it was really heartwarming. The um, uh, across the spectrum, I got really thoughtful, kind notes thanking me for for what I did. I thank you. Everyone should be thanking you, Ariana, because we all can sense uh, that something is going wrong. And you, you were one of the only brave souls who came out from within one of these organizations and said, yeah, you're not imagining it. <laughs> it actually is going wrong. And it's not good for, uh, any of us, the country, the democracy, our states of mind. Um, well, uh, I thank my mom for letting <laughs> giving me a place to live in the meantime. So I, I don't crank through my savings too much, but, um, I, I was in a position where I, I felt like it was a, you know, it wasn't an easy decision, but it was a relatively easy decision, um, given wow. the state, the state of things. So
how does Andrew Yang look so good? It's not easy. Uh, but part of it is wearing awesome gear. <laughs> I, I'm actually not that uh, hip or anything. But I do enjoy my clothes from Outer Known. Uh, I'm wearing a t-shirt right now. The, they're comfortable. They fit well. They're well made. And one thing that makes you feel good about them is you know that they're made in a way that's good for the environment. They provide living wages to people so like you feel conscientious. It was founded by pro surfer and 11-time world champion Kelly Slater. It's got that vibe. It's got kind of that beachy surfer vibe. So if this sounds like something you want to check out, go to OuterKnown.com today. And if you like the clothes, you can enter my code YANG at checkout and you get 25% off your first full price order. Wow. That's OuterKnown.com. O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com. Use my code YANG at checkout for 25% off. Check them out today, outerknown.com, and don't forget promo code YANG for 25% off. I don't know if you ever watched The Office, Andrew, but there's an episode where Michael Scott, Steve Carell, uh, puts on his jeans on like casual Friday, and he's like dancing around and putting it, like shaking his butt and putting it in everybody's face because he's like so happy and comfortable in his jeans. That is honestly a version of what I do when I wear my outer known jeans. They're freaking awesome. They look good. They feel good. Uh, so get that feeling. Get that warm, cozy feeling. Outerknown.com. Promo code YANG, get your 25% off. So you get this outpouring of support, uh, and now you turn your attention to how can we solve these problems. And it was that producer colleague of yours who said, uh, in like these forces are a cancer, but if you can cure the cancer, then you can uh, heal the world. Um, so I'm sure that now you've been doing some deep, digging and thinking as to how we can fix this. Uh, You're now the public editor of the Columbia Journalism Review. I think you're reviewing CNN. Is that right? What does that job consist of anyway? First, let's go there. (laughs) Well, it's, you know, once every couple of weeks, um, weighing in on something that I think that, you know, something that I've observed. And they they wanted me to use my experience as a producer. And so that's, I mean, it's impossible for me not to watch it without that eye. So, um, I, in general, kind of, I, I, I can't help it, and I, I hope I don't have tunnel vision, but coming into it, I know the challenges of the job. And so I've wanted to give them credit as well where I could, because um, I, I, I just know it, it, it is an incredibly difficult job, and the people are very smart, and they want to do the right thing. And, you know, most of what they're doing is, you know, news of some sort. Um, but I also know just I, I know the systemic issues as I think well as anyone pro- would. Probably I mean, yeah, anyone. Even, even and, so, it, yeah. and so I, I have tried to, to come at it from, from that angle with, you know, understanding and compassion, but like dinging the overall structure of the industry. So how do we fix this structure? And I'm just going to throw out a few big ideas just because, you know, I, I think these are the kinds of things you might need. Um, so one reason why NPR seems so free and glorious is because uh, its commercial incentives are less dominant, where you know it's getting money from uh, philanthropy or the feds um, or to some extent sponsors. And you have uh, the com- the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the CPB, which uh, also funds PBS, delightful PBS. You know, <laughs> or like you you kind of sense the difference immediately when you hit one of these. Um, public channels because it's it's kind of slower, softer, more wholesome, um, like less well lit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like like, yeah. the, the, like yeah. the, the the sets are worse. Uh, uh, one thing I I sense about them too is like the rhythm is different. And you talk about like the cable news rhythm. Uh, there, there's like a drum beat of graphics and the rundown uh you know it feels a little bit like a sports highlight show Uh, and then when you watch something on pbs or npr uh sometimes the conversations are longer more drawn out they're quote-unquote like more boring (laughs) i guess or or they're presented in a way that's less flashy um for sure so so number one would be trying to lift the ratings pressure in some way um, I think that, you know, you could start introducing things that might help. One one thing I imagined, which no one would go for, but uh, like I, I imagine a world where essentially um, like an hour of advertising blocks is like bought um, 
by public funding and then you can actually just do like an hour block of stuff ad free uh, and you could just have a sit down conversation with an expert and just like uh, do that and you know and like kind of change the the rhythm of it um, in a way that I think would be conducive to uh, something informative. The, a third one I'm going to throw out there, which I don't know how, how you would interpret this, is to try and revive the fairness doctrine from 1985, which was that if you were broadcasting something um, uh, issue related, then you have to cover both sides of the issue. Um, and that, that was in place before Fox and MSNBC came into being in, I think, the mid-90s. Um, so that, that's another possibility. Uh, I don't know if those ideas are things that you've already weighed and some of them you like, some of them you don't like. Um, I will, let's see here. Formatting, you know, they basically don't want to give any, you know, a person more than like two minutes of talk time um, per, per segment. And uh, obviously in public radio and PBS, they will give more time. And I think that people will stick with you if you're having a deep, meaningful conversation and they're actually learning something. Because I think humans are inherently instinctually curious animals. And if they're learning something new that they didn't know already, then, you know, they'll, they'll keep watching. But that's a, um, that's another discussion. Um, in terms of what can be done about the industry, I have not thought about the, the block advertising. That's an interesting idea. Um, I think there are things that can and should be done on on both sides. I would love to see public media um, enhanced and improved somehow. And you know, I find myself. I mean, I I, I agree with you. I think NPR um, is for me. It's probably the most reliable and consistent. And you know, in terms of um, getting news and information, um, PBS is great. But you get the news hour for one hour a day. And um, uh, I would love to see a public affairs channel on the public side, like dedicated to public affairs. And so that might mean multiple channels for PBS, um, which would mean, probably mean looking at a different funding structure. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about a funding structure similar to the BBC, which is a licensing fee, which doesn't go through the... Um, political process i would love i would love for us to emulate the bbc in a robust way i know uh, it's not anytime, perfect and they're having their own issues but it's yeah. still leaps and bounds better than what we're dealing with and, and one thing that that frustrates me a bit ariana is like here in the states people are like oh you can't have the state involved with media because you know or well totalitarianism and you're like look like the they've had the BBC for decades and it seems to irritate everyone equally. Uh, we've had PBS and NPR and no one's like, you know, accusing them <laughs> of, of trying to create an authoritarian state. Uh, you know, it's like there, there's such like a deep uh, reflexive knee jerk reaction against uh, the state having any, anything to do with media that I find not borne out by reality um, in other contexts with the BBC being one prominent example. So who's reached out to you wants to solve this problem, Ariana wants to crack this nut like because, uh, you know, I'm I'm someone who wants to try and fix this. But and I figure feel like right now you're one of the most uh, prominent and visible proponents of media reform at this point. Um, I, you know, in the, in, in the number of responses that I got when I posted my resignation statement, there were a number of different types of people. And so they, there were people who want to start their own um, new network of some sort or a podcast or you know, non-prop nonprofit, um, outlet. And I will say like, I admire that and support all of that work. I, but personally, I think that there needs to be some network with critical mass. So when you have these, these piecemeal options popping up, it's all great work, but I feel like it gets lost. And you know, the, the, general public, it doesn't reach them necessarily like it should. So I feel like you need a place with critical mass where people know and are familiar with and, and can go to it. That's a whole other um, other conversation. But yeah, I had um, a, a lot of people from the tech industry reach out, um, uh, people that are, um, you know, 
either with foundations or um, support foundation, you know, I do some work with philanthropy. They, um, I have been in touch with, with, um, I've heard from a uh, number of people and I am, I'm trying to, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what is going to make most sense. I mean, it's kind of daunting. I'm doing this right now by myself in a lot of ways. So I, I don't know. You are not alone, Ariana. <laughs> we are with you. There are so many people who are with you. <laughs> I just want to let you know Thank that. You. Thank you. Um, I, uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't know if it's if it's starting up a new organization or teaming up with some something that's already there. I, I've just kind of been at this point talking to people. Be and one of that you brought up the fairness doctrine. That's one of the big questions I've had. Is that something that we should re consider or something like it? You know, you know, there are, are you know, it had criticisms you know from both sides of the spectrum. You know, conservatives certainly maligned it, but. Um, uh, there were on the liberal side, there were people who had criticisms of, of the fairness doctrine as well. So it's like, you know, well, how do you create a standard for news that you can, that's enforceable? Um, and, you know, then you run into the problem, you know, if you have to give consideration to both sides of an issue, then you run into the whole, you know, false equivalency problem. And sometimes giving the other side that is not, um, it's not, Really you mean balanced. the anti-climate change doesn't really deserve a Oh hearing. my gosh, yes, yes. And that was, I, like, I struggled with that in my years in public radio. We would do these discussions about climate change. And then, you're, you, of course, you would have, you know, 100 scientists who were, were available and wanting to discuss climate change. And you're, you, we were forced to find someone on the opposite side. And it was really hard to find someone who wasn't funded by the petroleum industry. But we, were, we had to have that voice. And it was incredibly frustrating. No, that would be frustrating. I think at some point there, there should be like a 99% rule where if like 99% of scientists conclude something, then you, then you don't have to, to have that outlier on. Um, so I agree with you. There's a, real, um, there's a real consideration. Well, there are millions of Americans that want to join you as advocates for uh, better media uh, that actually makes us more informed and smarter and less inflamed. Um, if someone wanted to lend you a hand right now, and, and it could be that there's nothing that they can do, but like, is there a way they can keep up with you? Um, or, or say like, you know, I want to um, help support Ariana in, in her current activism? Um, well, I, I, you know, I have uh, my personal website, which is not a great website, but um, I post my activities there on the blog. I'm working on getting a new website. <laughs> to um, to make that a little easier and a little more efficient, um, I, and I'm on Twitter. I have not started any sort of an official organization. So if it's like you know, I don't have a um, GoFundMe site or anything like that. I love your instincts, Ariana, because I can sense that you are very much um, an accidental activist and an unwilling pundit, shall we say, in the sense, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like, they, like there are a lot of folks who'd be trying to take this and milk it. <laughs> no, and I, yeah, I'm a shy person by nature. So, you know, doing anything that is not, you know, behind the camera or behind the microphone, you know, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to do it, but I, I feel like it's so important that I, I, I do, you're right. I mean, I, I've been kind of pushed into this position, so... It is so important, and I can relate to a lot of it. Um, people don't believe this about me, but I actually uh, was happier to not necessarily be the front man of the band. <laughs> but, so well, I, I get it. We are all better off that do. you stepped out. So. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. It's changing the discussion. And, you, you know, it might be, I don't know how you feel about it. It might be incremental, but that's, that's how it's, you know, that's how it starts. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a hurry. Uh, and, <laughs> no. Okay, and okay, let's not be patient. Of, there, there's too much at stake. Yeah. yeah. Well, and unfortunately, because of some of the things that you've outlined uh, so thoroughly and personally, um, we don't have limitless time. Like time's not really on our side. Uh, and so you're, you're going to be a force for bringing us together. I hope I am too. And please do consider me a friend and partner and resource um, because we need you to succeed. We need you to find a place where you can just do what you do 
uh, you know, there has to be a home for producers who just want to produce good news that actually is what people need to hear as opposed to what people want to hear to be pissed off at the other side in a moment uh, or, you know, or, or they're, they're going to get to avoid things that don't conform to their worldview. I mean, that's not great. Uh, and we are in information silos right now, um, but you're going to be a big part of the solution. I can sense it. And also, you you have a fan in me and many others because you you did something so rare in modern life, which is you stood up for your principles, and you did it for a genuine way. Like it, it really wasn't like some kind of um, uh, self elevation or anything like that. You were just like, look, here, here's here's who I am. Here's what I think. Uh, and and now and I, I can sense this too. But even your current approach. Um, so yeah, we're we're gonna get to the bottom of this, Ariana. You and me. I like it. I'm excited. Thank you for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, please do subscribe to Yang Speaks and click on notifications so we can let you know every time we have a new episode.